that's if, if, if this law passes, will then become subsection five. So nothing substantive, but um, I just wanted to let you know we may be showing up again. We look forward to this. <laughs> <laughs> it will be really exciting, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can't make it and 
months and months, a couple of years Correct. go by, and they say we're too busy, then no one can attach these new devices. That, that's to trying to sell that product. Hopefully not years, but it's certainly uh, on the order of months, uh, uh, according to some of the evidence we received. <coughs> sure. So sure. under this process now, the new attacher, if it's simple, can come in and just do it themselves. And simple is defined as? Uh, simple is defined as, it's defined in the rule, but it's basically a low risk of loss of service. And finally, Mr. Chair, if you were the owner of these poles and wires, and, um, under what circumstances um, can you, can, can the people who wish to go ahead and get this stuff done be prohibited from going ahead and getting it done after we pass this rule? Uh, qualified, it's got to be a qualified contractor. Um, if they, if there's a risk, we call it real estate. So the pole owner can assert the right to retain uh, control over the process. They can also uh, assert extra time for the way it's described as good and sufficient cause. So there, if, if there are risks, if they don't uh, agree that it's, it's a simple make ready, that it's a simple process and there is a risk of that, they can prohibit, prohibit it in that situation. And I'm sorry, um, does the, uh, if there's work in the electrical space or pole replacement involved, does that mean it's not no longer simple? That means it's no longer simple. So at that point, if it's complex make ready and the one touch make ready doesn't apply. Under the, the current revisions proposed, the self-help does apply. Uh, and that allows contractors that are qualified to work in that space to perform the work if the deadlines are not met. So there are two parallel provisions that are being added. One is for easy, simple jobs, and one is for the complex jobs. Is the uh, <coughs> new attachment owner allowed to move the attachments of the companies? Uh, in both circumstances, yes. Uh, if it's simple, they can just move it under the, the one touch make ready provisions. Uh, if it is complex, then after the, the time, the deadline expires for the make ready work to be done by the owner of the attachment, then yes, they can come in with all of contractors. Does the rule differentiate between, uh, when we're just talking about attachments, is a fiber cable treated the same way as a wireless transmitter? It is. There, there's no technology recognition in the rule. Part of that is driven by Section 20A, Act 79, which was a statement of intent, which we interpreted as saying there should be no admittance uh, technology agnostic. <coughs> Senator McDonald? So we were, let's say you're one of the ten your stuff on a six mile piece of, uh, um, six miles down the road. Yes. And um, what is how does the one touch is that mean? So the one touch uh, basically puts control of the process in the hands of the new attacher, the person who's already screened their equipment, uh, if, if it's a simple make. -up. So our, our understanding from the information gathered during this process is that many poles don't require any make ready work. So if you, as you drive around, you can look at poles, and there's a huge open space. In those sort of circumstances, they could just come in and put their stuff up. But if they're if it is full and it may require uh, maybe moving things closer together, moving things higher, lower, uh, if that doesn't risk an outage, if that's a simple, if that qualifies as simple, then the the you know, so my, which would lead to I think my final question was if you got a six mile stretch you wanna you wanna serve and you wanna pull that <coughs> stuff up and there are only like three or four poles that are complicated, can this and the, uh, this entity go in and, and do you know five and three quarter miles and uh, and and, and, um, and then you know pressure control the, the owner to get a wiggle on and do that complicated stuff or do they have to wait until this little section is done before they can do the whole six miles? Right, that's certainly an issue that, that uh, came up and I believe Mr. Tomei will probably will probably talk to that today uh, with you guys uh, but but no the way that works is if, if any 
component of the application. If any holes in the application are complex, the application becomes complex. So a whole kit and boodle can't be started while you wait for this one little thing to get solved? That's right. So if I'm someone who I must see don't want these things on my poles because I got my own plans and I'm, you know, put my own stuff in there. I can use this provision to postpone and get it done? Uh, it wouldn't be a postponement. It will be a postponement until uh, the self-help provision is kicked in. <laughs> so we have two separate, two separate provisions. We have one to make ready and then we have the self-help. If the deadlines are not met, then... You mean like they haven't been met in the past? Yes. Then the self-help provisions. Right now, there's currently no self-help provisions. So if the deadlines are not met, there's no recourse for the new attacher. Now, if the deadlines are not met, the, the attacher can go in and, and perform self-help. So there is some additional delay that will occur. So the only way I can slow them down is to not do this little part of the six-mile stretch. And effectively, they can't put any of that stuff up, and I continue to be able to delay and keep them off my poles. Until self-help. Oh, it's after after the deadline passes. Mm -hmm. So they, the, the existing attacher has a deadline to perform their work. If yeah. they don't, then the new attacher can come in, and it's basically a one-touch make ready situation. They can come in in the area where it's complex. And yes, work? yes. So self-help applies to complex full replacements and work above the, the electric space. Um, who conducts the initial? Uh, it depends on whether or not you're in a one-touch ready situation. If, if the new attacher believes that the situation is simple, the attachments are simple, then they perform the make ready, and that's part of assessing whether or not they can file an application for one-touch make ready. So they would, in that instance, the new attacher would perform the preliminary uh, survey. In the standard situation, it's the full one. So it, as usual, the answer is either. <laughs> they're, they're all terminals, yeah. right. And yeah. it works different in the two, in the two uh, scenarios. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions for this witness? I had a lot of yeah. questions, but they're really more directed toward policy issues that I've discussed here. Um, I won't have, except when is the SEC going to Get its arms around us and have a unified system. Did you have an answer for that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, if you could take a seat and then the next one, we may ask you that. Uh, John Brayback. Can you do a selfie here, John? Uh, we can do an all-inclusive <coughs> selfie. We can do a Liz Warren selfie. <laughs> uh, for the record, John Graybent is my name. I'm the Liz, I'm sorry, the Regulatory Affairs Director uh, for uh, Vermonters for a Clean Environment. I'm here to speak to you today about the full attachment rule. I do not you know, blow through my testimony pretty quickly. It takes me eight minutes practicing, uh, so without questions. So. Uh, as I've said, my name is John Brabant and introduce myself. Uh, VCE participated in the PUC's uh, May 29, 19 workshop on the poll attachment rule. We filed comments on the draft rule and spoke at two separate public hearings held by the PUC. Our efforts to have an impact on the PUC's poll attachment rule update were frustrated by the legislature's directive to the PUC, which was very specific and tied the hands of the PUC, making them unable to address our members' concerns about the new type of telecommunications equipment that is being installed in Vermont. The PUC responded to our comments by saying, quote, um, VCE correctly notes that the legislature has not taken testi testimony on the numerous new issues raised by this technological change, namely the large-scale deployment of small cell antennas Further, the legislature's request for a study from the Commissioner of Health submitted no letter later than January 1, 2020, indicates that at least some members of the legislature may be contemplating additional statutory changes on this matter. Nothing in our rules should be interpreted as taking a position on small cell technology. Rather, this is a matter that appears to be headed to the legislature for further guidance. 
so we are here today to brief you on, on these issues and ask that the committees of jurisdiction on which some of you serve take up these issues um, in this legislative session. The VCE does not oppose your approving the adoption of this rule today, though we would prefer that it promote fiber optic cable while at the same time uh, staying the deployment of small cell antennas until the numerous issues raised by them are addressed. We want you to be aware of what it is you are enabling by approving the rule as it has been updated as specifically directed by this legislature. We understand that Section 248A, um, that's the area of Title, uh, I believe Title 30 that uh, empowers the PUC. Uh, Section 248A, uh, sunsets this year and so that is an appropriate vehicle to investigate these issues through the House Energy and Technology Committee and the Senate Finance Committee. In addition we seek hearings on the health issues in the Senate Health and Welfare Committee and the House Health Care Committee. So uh, we are prepared, we have prepared some documents to illustrate, they're in your packets I hope, uh, why the poll attachment rule as currently written is deficient in addressing the latest technologies that are being implemented right now in Vermont. So I refer you first to Exhibit 1, the Poll Attachment Rule Info Document. Page 1 shows the various spectrums, it's a bar graph, used in, we prepared this, uh, used in wireless telecommunication antennas. Everything shown in orange represents 5G technology. Um, um, which is being newly deployed. Green is 4G, purple is 3G, blue is 2G. While most people who have heard of 5G think of it as strictly high frequency microwave antennas that are 24 gigahertz and above, as this image makes clear, 5G is more than that and involves low, mid, and high band frequencies, all of which are shown in orange. So they deploy three bandwidth um, ranges to implement this technology. Um, the techno telecom industry plans to deploy 5G to, quote unquote, in every corner of the country. And that's a quote of President Obama's FCC chair, including rural areas such as Vermont, blanketing areas with a range of radio frequency radiation. <clears throat> a year ago, the Senate Finance Committee asked representatives AT of AT&T, Verizon, and Vtel about their plans for 5G and left the committee with the impression, as summed up by the chair, that, quote, 5G is not coming to Vermont anytime soon, unquote. However, if you look at Exhibit 2 in your packets, a petition by AT&T with clear language in blue and underlined states, the company has a goal of deploying its 5G network nationwide in 2020. This identical, lang identical language has been uh, filed with the PUC in many AT&T advance notices for new antennas. Yes, 5G is coming to Vermont. In fact, the infrastructure is already here. If you look at page two of exhibit one, uh, VCE has mapped all full attachment canister antennas, also known as cantennas, uh, petitions filed by AT&T and already approved by the PUC and one by Verizon that is pending in Chittenden County, noted by the yellow pushpins in the graphic. Um, I want to bring your attention to the header of that graphic. It says up to 5.9 megahertz. And then the following graphic that, that shows pushpins with stow, uh, equipment being in, installed on the Stowe Mountain Road as 5 megahertz. That should be changed to 5.9 gigahertz, 5.925 gigahertz, respectively. Um, So the AT&T project narratives contain this language. The project also allows AT&T to prepare for impl implementation of newer technologies, including 5G capabilities, smart cities, and new developments in the Internet of Things. Each of the yellow pushpins represents a mid-band 5G canister antenna, some in the residential neighborhoods outside people's bedrooms, a few hundred feet away. Many of these are already erected, and some have involved zero notice to people outside whose homes the antennas have been placed. As one person who we spoke with put it, I woke up one morning, and I realized I had ugly stuff hanging on my front yard pole, and 
and a strange can on the top, and I had no idea what it was doing there. So these are some things that we would ask of you. Notification is one of the issues we asked the legislature to address in this session. People should get prior notice that this stuff is going to be deployed outside their bedroom windows. Um, aesthetics and property values, again, aren't addressed in the rule or in the statute. Uh, again, not a problem, not a fault, the fault of the PUC. They followed the clear directive. We're not disputing that. But aesthetics do need to be addressed. Um, page three of Exhibit 1 shows the location of recent applications by Verizon for mid-range 5G canister antennas on utility poles in Stone Mountain Road. Uh, VCE compiled a table of all tower and antenna advance notices and petitions made to the PUC in the last four months of page 2019. If you look at page four of Exhibit 1, Exhibit and Exhibit exhibit 3, we prepared an Excel spreadsheet that has been submitted to you. Telecom providers are swapping out older antennas with new legacy mid-range 5G antennas at existing structures and applying for new towers. In public meetings, when questioned about whether these new towers will host 5G, the answers from Verizon and AT&T have been yes, eventually, but they're here now. We found four microwave antenna applications among those filed in the last four months. One in particular is concerning as it is very close to the South Burlington Rec Path and only a few hundred feet from the Rice Memorial High School's ball field. And you can look at that on page five of exhibit one. It is unclear from the filings if this is a 5G related antenna but what we do know is that this is an existing telecommunications tower facility that is likely to have many other antennas added. And in response to VCE's public comment asking the PUC to require pre- and post-construction monitoring to ensure compliance with FCC's existing standards, the, application, the applicant seriously objected. So we would ask, again, that the committees of jurisdiction um, uh, require pre- and post-construction monitoring um, to assure compliance with the FCC standards that are already in place. Um, and we would like to, again, for the legislature to take this up this session. On December 23rd, 2019, the Vermont Department of Health submitted its report, which was done at the request of this legislature, and that's contained in Exhibit 4. We have excerpted, excerpted some sections of the report, and you can find those on page six of Exhibit One. The report supports concerns raised by DCE and our members <coughs> about exposure to already existing radio frequency radiation, RFR radiation, from 2G and 3G, with evidence of potential for cancer from exposure to RFR. The report recommends the need for efforts in public health to minimize the dose to RFR, especially to children. Uh, RFR effects on public health are an issue and that we asked the legislature to take testimony on in this session and we would ask that industry funded uh, studies uh, not be taken uh, into account. In summary, the telecommunications industry intends to deploy 5G technology in every corner of the country, including rural areas, and it's already happening in Vermont. The industry stands to make trillions of dollars deploying a technology that has by its own admission to Senator Blumenthal in a congressional hearing last year, and it's at the back of my testimony, and with links to the actual video of it, um, conduct the, the industry admitted to con having conducted no studies on the safety of 5G for effects on public health and the environment. This new technology has never been in public use, and it affects every living being, including bees and birds. There are many things that cities and states can do and are doing nationally uh, in response to this industry pressure. We are asking you in this legislative session to delve into what can be done and take action to protect Vermonters from this untested technology. And I thank you for your time and allowing me to testify today. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions for this one? These all lists of locations of where stuff so, has already been installed? And I, they are either, in, they are lists of petitions for amendments to their CPGs or new CPGs for these installs. Um, and it was put together on a spreadsheet when we printed out, it comes out on multiple pages, I apologize. It was an Excel spreadsheet. But they are either uh, already approved and installed or uh, 
pending. To answer your question, sir. So in the impending, in the event, I feel likely or unlikely, but in the event that you know, someone determines that these things are not healthy, um, then they would all just uh, never, never get used, and all this investment would go down in the tubes. Companies would have to write all this stuff off. I guess that's how it works. I guess I think that's what uh, Dow yeah, Chemical did when the DDT was banned. So. Well, it, it, it didn't, doesn't work that way all the time. Sometimes they uh, just get, get us to say it was an honest mistake and let them do it anyway. Um, I, I, I think at some point the, this legislature and at the federal level you cannot, you can no longer plead ignorance if folks keep bringing this information to you and you choose, consciously choose not to look into it, not to study it. The NTP, the federal government, uh, the, the um, NTP is a branch of the National Institute of Health. Uh, it's the uh, National Toxicological Toxicology Program. It's a division of the uh, a program within the Department of Hum Health and Human Services. Uh, these findings that we're telling you, these are not made up by us. This, is, this has been made up been, as a result of studies by the federal. It's all over my head. It's no pun intended. So, yeah. I just would, would say that there's a difference between what the NTP does and what others do and the type of research they perform, so don't cite, I don't think we should cite one specific. Well, we, we, we can provide you numerous other sites, nationally and internationally. Okay, but but these, these are into, already in place. We're getting into some policy just, areas, and obviously with the report that just came out on January 1st, encouraging us to look at a report that we have already read is interesting. I thank you for that and whether or not committees of jurisdiction take these issues up depends a lot on other um, concerns that we have that are equally compelling. So, yes, um, I understand that, busy so. Yes, I understand what you're saying, but I'm trying to understand, and I'd like you to give a very specific comment about how you are, what you are asking with respect to the rule that's proposed. Exactly, thank you for can the question. Can you do that? Absolutely can, thank you. Simply. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, what we would propose is that uh, you direct the PUC to go back and bifurcate the rule, put the brakes on the rollout of the wireless aspects contained in the rule, rollout of the wireless, uh, what do they call those, quick attachments, make ready attachments, and, and immediately, and, and direct them at the same time to immediately implement the rule aspects. Uh, that would apply to fiber optic. So we do not want to see fiber optic delayed. So my earlier question about not making a distinction between cable and transmitters, you would like to see that distinction made in different treatments? Yes. Absolutely. That is our request. Succinctly. It's better than I am. So. <laughs> um, and if there are no further questions, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Tomei up. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you Thank very you. much. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I ask a question to committee members around finance? So I think you worked on this issue last year, is that correct? There we go. That's right. All right. On this one on the last <coughs> on this one coming up? On, on this rule was Thing, thing. I'm asking about uh, legislative intent. So, is, was there were, the question has just been raised about <coughs> bifurcating the rule? Was there any expression of a desire to see a bifurcated rule brought forward, or is there language one way or the other in the underlying statute? Uh, okay. I, I, I believe there's no in the underlying statute. No direction to, to notice <coughs> technology agnostic. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Irv Tomei. I'm a resident of Norwich. Uh, I am, in the past seven years, I've been chair of uh, the East Central, what is now called the East Central Vermont Telecommunications District, but it's more widely known as EC Fiber. Uh, we're the first communications union district formed in the state. Uh, after passage of enabling legislation almost five years ago, five years ago this spring. Uh, we have 23 active member towns. Uh, we have about 40, 4100, more than 4100 people connected now to fiber 
Uh, we are extremely pleased with um, everything that the PUC has done in rule revisions and concerning Make Ready. Uh, Make Ready delays have been a, a serious problem ever since we started. Uh, we aren't funded from local taxes. Uh, we borrow money and, uh, in the municipal bond markets because a, a union district, of course, is a, under state law, is a, effectively a virtual municipality. We borrow against future revenues, our customer fees, cover the debt service and our operating costs. But when, uh, in the past, when the deadline supposedly was 120 days to get make ready debt done, but sometimes it could go on for two, even three times that time, length of time, we were paying interest on borrowed money with no revenue to offset the costs. Uh, at the risk of sounding rude, no. Uh, we have five other topics to oh, conclude okay. before nine o'clock. Okay, I'm very sorry. But um, that that's urge that is sufficient. That is, <laughs> but I wanted to give that background for people here who aren't uh, acquainted with the issues. So, um, I think the question. There are two questions. The major one is: Is it the intention that the timelines allowed under the new rules to get make ready done mean to get all the make ready done? Or that the timeline to get for the poll owner to get its work done. Uh, the legis uh, section uh, 19, I believe it is, <coughs> begins by uh, 1A calls for measures to encourage poll owners to get their work done in sufficient time, adequate time or sufficient time to make it reasonably possible for other attachers to get their work done too. The PUC, uh, that is the one area where we weren't entirely happy. Uh, the PUC said, well, um, if it doesn't get done, then you've got self-help. But that is, the problem is, until a new, if polls need replacement, until the poll is replaced, other attachers can't move their equipment to the new poll. It's not there yet. And so, uh, it was hoped that there'd be some encouragement to get holes replaced before the 59th day of a 60-day period. Uh, that's the, the only doubt. Uh, we also had minor, a minor issue about uh, misunderstanding about uh, being whole owners and attaching entities being present when our contractors do the work. Our contractors are the same contractors that the other people, that the incumbents use, and there will be an ability to inspect afterwards. But uh, as Comcast put it in their letter, if they choose to show up, that's fine. We were simply concerned that there might be delays in questions what's reasonable opportunity to be present. Uh, if it's interpreted as if they choose to show up, that's fine. We don't have to wait for them to schedule it. Then we're happy with that. I'm not answering any questions, and I apologize for my introduction. Uh, no apology needed. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, so thank you for highlighting that, yeah. that need for clarification. Are there any questions? Senator yes. McDonald. We directed the PUC to write a rule that stopped uh, the owners of the polls from dilly-dallying about, for whatever reason, um, and preventing the broadband from being sent out. And your testimony is that they've done a pretty darn good job, yes. except the one area that may still exist where they can dilly dally by um, holding up a whole six mile stretch because this part um, is not ready to go. Is that your testimony? Basically, yes. And, yes, sir. and, and you, know, you were there. Well, we had 90% yeah. happy. 90% yeah. happy. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what you're unhappy about is the policy in this particular one small thing. Uh, I won't say unhappy, but less than happy. We're not policy people, but sometimes we. Uh, Recommend that the rule be implemented and, and that there might be an area in there that we believe doesn't meet the policies established by the, the committee of jurisdiction. So you, I, you're clear. Thank you. Any further questions? Mr. Dostas, did you have a? No, if I could speak for 30 seconds. 
29. 29. <laughs> <laughs> really brief. Thank you. Robert Dawson for Free Mountain Power. Um, it's been a learning curve learning about all this. I know it's very interesting. I'm very happy to hear that um, the rules as they've been promulgated now are meeting 90% of the needs of, of the CC fiber. Um, I, I would say this rule is going to guess, uh, address a lot of the concerns that have been raised. I think it's going to move uh, the deployment much more quickly. In looking at the rule, we think it meets the legislative intent. I looked at you know, like Section 20A. It's very clear what they do intend. The rule like, meets that. The issue around working about G GMP, particularly GMP folks being there when contractors are working in our space, we do that now when we hire contractors. We, we have a list of contractors, but those contractors, people within that company can change. Um, they may not have the experience, they may have questions, there may be other things that they find. We want to have our person there on site um, to be able to address anything that may come up. So we do that with our crew and we would want to do that with anybody who's working in our space. And that's really from a safety uh, perspective. Um, so just, uh, and I think, and I, our hope is that Self-help will never be needed. We have come a long way, in part because of the conversations that happened in this building. We've come a long way. Messages have been sent to the pole owners as well as those that want to attach that you guys got to work better together. And we are. And we are meeting in advance. We're going to be planning together in advance. And this this bill would help. Does it, uh, this rule will help? Because in the end, if for some reason we fail, there's a remedy by the attachees. They can actually do the work themselves. We'll be able to watch, but they can do the work themselves. So I think in the end, it, it's landed in a very good spot. It may not be 100%, but we never get 100% of what we want. But it's a great foundation in which to work. If we find there are still problems, I can assure you, some people will get back there letting you know about what those problems are. So we encourage the passage of the rule as, as it is. Uh, before you go. Just making a connection, we were often siloed in our conversations in this building. We spent all day yesterday in the judiciary talking about medical monitoring. You folks taking a look at that bill with respect to 5G rollout? Just going to point at that seat. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. You're very happy with 90% of the goal being achieved here? <laughs> um, I was just repeating what the former. Person. No, you said GMP. What is GMP? It's very happy we, 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 we believe the rule should be passed as it's been. Okay, so okay. Right. Yeah. my question would be would you be happier if it was 100% or 80%? It's no longer germane. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. I'm going to stretch the rules for 30 seconds for Mr. Whitaker. Uh, uh, I. I followed this since well, there's two dockets that the PUC litigated. One on Volta, Stephen yourself. Whitaker, Montpelier. Two dockets that the PUC has addressed polls recently. One was uh, the rates charged, uh, a two-year, three-year docket, and they did not reach resolution on a revenue-neutral poll attachment. And then this docket itself uh, with the one-touch make ready. I support the model that you bifurcate the rule and that you make this specific limited to fiber and cable builds, not antennas. The antennas, especially in light of the sunset of the 248A pending and discussions around the health, unresolved uh, health issues, I point out that the state is preempted by the FCC on addressing health issues, but that does not prevent communities from being involved in, for aesthetic or other reasons, locating them farther away from bus stops or playgrounds, etc. So bifurcating the rule is fully important. Also keep in mind that we have decades of neglected double poles and Green Mountain Power just inherited or bought many of those from uh, Fairpoint. There had been a million dollar reserve held to remove the double poles when Verizon sold to Fairpoint. That still has not been done and the problem has been compounded. So you need to be thinking about a uniform statewide poll database which would accelerate and inform these decisions. That way you know what's on every poll, how long it's been there, which polls need to be removed. The end of my driveway is a case study of Delta Pulse. Oh, I can give you <laughs> thousands yeah. of case studies. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.
Senator Bray. Um, if there are no more witnesses, I would move approval of Rule 19P61. Any further discussion? If not, uh, just the whole, um, just the, okay, the last witness. Uh, we, he didn't give us the reason for by, the proposed bifurcation. Or, I'd be happy to clarify that very briefly. The reason for bifurcating the rule is because the implications of microcells and the there is new planning requirements in the same bill that re authorize this for the study of neutral hosts. Neutral host model where all the carriers share a piece of small cell infrastructure is the only model that's going to give us all carriers coverage across Vermont. That is up for review later in this session due to the expiration of Act 248A. So until we analyze the potential of neutral host and where those antennas are going to be and who's going to own them, we're making a mess and we're actually putting impediments in our way by allowing the pole attachment make ready to expedite fiber to be used for small cell attachments. It was, it's a, a wolf in sheep's, sheep's clothing. Okay. So the, we have a bunch of, of uh, requirements to entertain when we say that, that something is, shouldn't be in rule. What's the one you're picking here? The rule has unintended consequences that have not been examined with regards to the inclusion of small cells under what was designed and promoted as a fiber make ready uh, no, I, I mean, problem resolution. The, the risk of my interpretation, you're saying that uh, putting up 5G stuff in the absence of a study about health is arbitrary or, or not? I mean, what, what do you, is it arbitrary rule? It's, it, it is, it is arbitrary, it's reckless. Uh, it could be negligent. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm. Okay. I, I've been working on this stuff for 25 okay. years, and okay. in the, we don't have a telecom plan to guide you in this okay. momentous okay. decision. Thank you. We have a motion on the table. And that unless there's further discussion, those in favor of approving the rule as presented say aye. 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 Those opposed? Say nay. 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 And the vote is four to two in favor of the rule. Uh, thank you. The next rule on the agenda, um, 19P73, Vermont Fire Service Training Council. <coughs> 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 